we're now recording. Uh, great. So thank you all so much for being here and welcome. Um, I wanted to start by sharing a few pieces of context and background. Um, as you all know, those of you that are cooking are cooking for guests at Lincoln Park Community Services which brings communities together to empower individuals facing homelessness and poverty um, to secure stable housing and make sustainable life changes. Um, they started in the basement of a church in Lincoln Park on Fullerton, um, and they have since expanded to a second location on Sedgwick in Old Town, which is where um, those of you who are dropping food will be dropping your food today. Um, and so as we were thinking about cooking for, for folks in the Lincoln Park Community Services and you know, understanding the neighborhood and, and contextualizing that, we thought about our colleague's husband, um, Danielle K. Hurst. Um, and we thought, wow, he's the author of this incredible book, The Battle of Lincoln Park, Urban Renewal and Gentrification in Chicago. And how awesome would it be to have an expert who really has studied the evolution of the neighborhood and the city and its impacts um, and how that does impact race and racism and racial justice, since that really is our context for today. Um, so we'll spend the next you know, time together, 55 minutes or so, um, interviewing Daniel and really being able to get his knowledge and wisdom. We will save time at the end for those of you that have questions as well. So feel free to start thinking about what you wanna know from Daniel that we haven't already asked. Um, and I will go over, I'll save the last five minutes of the call for any logistics around those of you that are dropping off your food or having someone pick up your food. Um, we'll review how that process works so that no one is uncertain. Um, and I'm excited to turn it over to Molly to introduce Daniel. Thank you. I mean, you started the introduction, but I'll just give a little bit more background and context about who Daniel is, what he does with his everyday life. And then I'll ask him the first question, we'll start it off. So Daniel is a policy analyst and writer who focuses on public finance, housing, and transportation, especially as it relates to urban issues. He's a research director at the Center for Tax and Budget Accountability in Chicago. And before that, he was senior fellow at City Observatory and has written as a freelancer for outlets like The Atlantic, Chicago Reader, The Southside Weekly, among others. Um, and his first book, The Battle of Lincoln Park, which Melissa just mentioned, was published by Belt Publishing in October of 2018. And hopefully many of you have already received your copy. I know that I did and I'm sitting right on my nightstand. I'm excited to read it. Um, and I hope that you all take the time to listen to him today, but then also check out the book afterwards. And so your book is called The Battle of Lincoln Park, Urban Renewal and Gentrification in Chicago. And just to get the conversation started out, can you talk about the definitions for gentrification and urban renewal and what are the differences, the nuances between them? Yeah, sure. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. This is really fun to get to talk about this with everybody. Um, so yeah, so urban renewal, I think, has a, a, an easier definition, which is urban renewal was actually a set of um, federal uh, policies and programs um, starting, you know, you could say probably in the 30s, really reaching their peak in the 50s and 60s. Um, that basically said, you know, um, looked at American cities, saw them as um, old uh, and um, uh, and dangerous and um, you know unsanitary. Uh, and and um, both sort of physically out of date as well as promoting of, of bad social problems and said that the right way to deal with that was to tear them down and start over, right? And so Urban Renewal was really this program uh, and, and funding, lots and lots of funding that, that said that we should tear down um, older parts of American cities by the, you know, entire street or, you know, square mile for that matter and rebuild them sort of from the ground up to try and make those things better. And, you know, to some extent, I think some of that was, was well-intentioned, but it obviously directly hurt and displaced um, I mean, millions of people across the country and many, many uh, hundreds of thousands in Chicago. Gentrification, I think is a, a more um, fraught, def a more fraught word. And I actually take pains not to use it very much uh, other than in the subtitle uh, in the book, because I think people came, come to it with such different ideas that I wasn't trying to like uh, 
get into that sort of semantics, but in, I do briefly define it in the book and, and the, what I use is um, it is a, an influx of people with greater um, social and economic power than people who, uh, than the predominant group that, that lives in a neighborhood previously. Um, and people who don't have social ties to the people who live in the neighborhood. So I think it's importantly not just, for me, not just um, you know that the incomes are going up, but that incomes are going up specifically because people are moving in who are not you know related to or in, you know going to the same churches as or synagogues or um, you know are, are seen as socially distant from the you know current residents. Great, thanks so much. I appreciate the framing you gave around gentrification because I think that's so true. It's like this sort of buzzword, but um, defining it and actually using it in its truest form is more complicated. Um, so I wanna segue us into, so today is the Chicago uh, Racial Justice Day of Learning, as we said. And so we'd really be remiss to not start with or continue with um, a question that explicitly asks you, Daniel, Daniel, like what does your book and what do these concepts have to do with race and racism and racial justice? Yeah, I think that really um, gets to why I, I wrote the book. So I, I um, for a long time, my, my parents, when I was in high school, had a book called uh, Making the Second Ghetto on our bookshelf that I picked up, which is, a, if you haven't read it, it's an incredible history, is still one of the best histories of how the South and West sides came to be, um, came to have large, you know, segregated almost, you know, entirely African-American neighborhoods uh, over such large swaths of them, which, which was not something that existed in 1900 or even 1920, but by 1950, 1960, um, you know, the, the, those boundaries of segregation on the South, and the South side in particular, looked pretty much, pretty close to how it does today. Um, and so I, I read that when I was a kid, uh, when, when I was in high school, at the time I was going to um, to Whitney Young uh, High School in the city and was sort of just getting to know people from all over the city, starting to travel and to different neighborhoods and seeing how different the city was. And that book really helped crystallize for me, like why, yeah, go Dolphins, see in the chat. Um, the, the really helps crystallize for me, um, you know, the, the, the fact that you know, neighborhoods that some of my friends lived in were so different from the one that I lived in was not an accident. It was the result of very, you know, uh, purposeful and, um, uh, you know, decisions both that, that policymakers had made, but also that, you know, regular um, people on the ground had made about how to behave when um, Black people moved, started moving to the city in greater numbers. Several years ago, I started thinking more about the fact that, um, there's actually, you know, following Making the Second Ghetto, there's a, there's a great amount of writing, really important writing that covers sort of that history of how the South and West Sides came to be segregated in the way that they are. But, you know, I knew at, at that point that, um, you know, the North Side uh, also had changed dramatically since, you know, 1950. Um, it had, you know, been predominantly white, I think, for, for that time, but it had not been um, predominantly, you know, upper class or upper middle class in the way that so much of the North Side is now. And I started looking for, um, you know, looking for, for explanations of, you know, what, what was that history? And basically not, not finding exactly what I was looking for was the impetus for, you know, writing the book it was sort of writing what, what I had wanted to read. And I think what became really clear to me over the course of writing, of writing it and researching it was that um, it was not that there's, you know, one set of stories about how the South Side came to be the way that it is today and another set of stories about how the North Side came to be, um, that those two, those two stories are really one and um, the gentrification, the transformation of the North side or much of it into this, you know, um, very predominantly white, <clears throat> um, increasingly wealthy um, zone only makes sense in the context of the fact that the South and West sides were becoming um, segregated in the opposite direction at the same time. And I think that's still true. Um, 
you know, Lincoln Park in 1970, what was happening there only makes sense in the context of what was happening in Englewood and Austin and South Shore at the same time. And that the people in Lincoln Park were very aware of what was happening there. And much of what they were doing was explicitly in response to that, even if it was happening, you know, many miles from their home, although in some cases not so many miles because, you know, Cabrini Green, which was built just south of Lincoln Park in the 50s and 60s, um, was, you know, is also very much a, a piece of the story of um, racial justice and injustice and segregation in the city. And what happened in Lincoln Park was also very much a reaction to the existence of Cabrini Green so close by. Um, I've been uh, talking for a while, so I'll, I'll wrap up. But, the, you know, the one last thing, one of the things that I think sort of encapsulates this is that, so, you know, in, 19, in, the, in the 1920s, um, was sort of the very the, the very beginning of the formation of what was then called a black belt uh, on the south side and what's now called Bronzeville. And um, there was also a, a much smaller one that was developing on the west side. And there was this very, and then there was this very, very much smaller black neighborhood around what's now Cabrini Green or what had, what became Cabrini Green. And um, the Tribune actually wrote uh, an op-ed basically openly worrying that the small black neighborhood around the near north side would eventually turn into a third quote black belt that would basically turn the North Lakefront into an entirely black um, section of town because the assumption was as soon as black people moved in the white people would all flee. And so you know I do think that there is a way of looking at the story of Lincoln Park that the the gentrification and urban renewal that happened in Lincoln Park was in some ways serving to create this bulwark north of Cabrini Green to stop the north side from becoming black. And I think that's a, that, is one, um, that is one way that people interpreted what they were doing at the time. And I think that's an important sort of big picture way of, of thinking of it as well. It's sort of to, to keep the north side white. It was necessary to create the sort of center of wealth on the near north side. So I think a lot of us on this call either live in Lincoln Park or spend a lot of time in Lincoln Park. Personally, over the summer, I spent almost every weekend in Oz Park and over by the zoo. Um, so what's something that you think we should know about the history of where we live and spend a lot of our time? Um, there's a, a lot of things. I mean, I think... Um, you know, the biggest thing is just there is a history. I remember I, I had a, a an early um, book event uh, where somebody said something like, yeah, I didn't know that Lincoln Park had a history. Um, and I think it's easy, you know, for a, rel you know, a relatively stable um, historic neighborhood like Lincoln Park to look around and sort of think that, well, it's always more or less been like this. And, you know, it hasn't. Um, it was very, very different um, in 1960, 70, even into the 80s. The, these, um, you know, changes were pretty constant and and were very contested. People fought over it, right? People really fought over the direction of the neighborhood. Um, and you know, I guess so. That, that's that's really the main thing. I, I think that there are lots of um, once you sort of read the history, there are lots of things that sort of smack you in the face uh, about the built environment, but just what it looks like now. So, you know, why does North Avenue look the way it does at the southern end of Lincoln Park? That used to be a narrow, um, two-lane, very busy, traditional commercial street with three-story, um, three or four-story uh, walk-up apartment buildings and storefronts and, um, you know, was a relatively, right, now, now it's obviously this, you know, sort of huge, almost highway that leads up to Lakeshore Drive. Um, that was an urban renewal move in the 1960s, because at the time, the area to the south of there was seen as a much more sort of, um, you know, high poverty, less white area. And um, they tore down almost all of North Avenue and doubled its width uh, and called it a modified expressway. And that was seen as a way of, of creating a barrier between people in Lincoln Park and the neighborhoods to the south. Um, similarly, uh, Larrabee Street from North Avenue to um, uh, all the way to about 2200 North, I think. Um, you'll notice if you walk on, the, on, uh, on that street, there's almost no historic buildings left. There's no 19th century buildings left on that street and all the blocks around it are pretty much 
you know, it's all these older buildings. Um, that was also completely torn down in the 60s as a result of urban renewal. Um, it was at the time understood as sort of a dividing line between what was already a wealthier portion to the east and a lower income portion to the west. And Ozpark itself, as you mentioned, Ozpark didn't exist. Ozpark was also a creation of urban renewal. It, at the time it was, you know, it was apartment buildings. Um, people lived there and it was, um, it was uh, actually a predominantly, uh, it, was, it was near the predominantly Puerto Rican part of the, of the neighborhood. Um, and it was all cleared out to create a park, um, again, as a sort of neighborhood improvement campaign. Wow, so interesting. I feel so like I'm humbled by the amount of time that I spend um, on those streets and the things that I wasn't previously noticing, but I'm now going to definitely start to pay more attention to. So thanks for sharing that. Um, I'm curious if you can share with us, like why does knowing that matter? Why does knowing the neighborhood's history, why should it matter to us today? I think it matters because it, um, I think it's a, a step towards acknowledging what other outcomes there might have been and what other outcomes there still might be now um, that, you know, neighborhood histories have, um, or, or just neighborhoods are the way they are because they have a history and because people fought over that history and, you know, people are continuing to fight, uh, you know, in different ways over what Chicago neighborhoods look like. Um, so I, I, I think that's that's one way in which it matters. So that's a perfect segue. It matters to me because I grew up in Lincoln Park and um, like from the time I was born in 1995 is when my family bought our house in Lincoln Park and that's where I grew up for most of my life. But I didn't know anything about the history of um, where I live besides there was like a plaque on the ground that said there used to be a hospital here. Um, so for those who live in Lincoln Park or are curious like myself, where can I go to find out more information about the history of, of where I lived? Yeah, I love this question. Um, uh, so this book would not have been possible without the reference library special collections at DePaul University, which has an amazing collection of, in particular, Lincoln Park neighborhood history. Um, and uh, the staff who works there is incredibly helpful. So, and you can just like, you don't have to be affiliated with DePaul. I am not affiliated with DePaul. You can just like walk in uh, and, you know, they have their lists of documents and collections online. Some of them are even digitized and you don't even have to go in, but uh, a lot of them aren't. Uh, you can just go in and you can just say, I, you know, I want to look at this box and they'll take out a box and you can read through old newsletters and posters and uh, letters and, and everything. And it's amazing. Um, so I fell in love with, I had never done archival research before doing this book uh, and completely fell in love with it. And I highly recommend it to anybody who feels like they, they might have sympathies in that direction. Um, and, you know, if you're looking for things that aren't just about Lincoln Park, there's other places that, that also have similar collections. So UIC Library, Harold Washington Library, um, the Chicago History Museum all have tons and tons and tons of neighborhood resources. Uh, also the Newberry Library. Um, but the other thing that's like even easier than that is um, the Chicago Tribune archives which are available if you have a Chicago Public Library account. You can go on their website, go to their online resources section and find a you know, searchable archive of every Tribune art article ever written. Um, and you know, type in your street and just start looking, you know, reading. You can sort of narrow it by decade or by year or whatever else. Um, and that was a really uh, fun, an easy way to just sort of explore, like, what can I, you know, what what have people talked about on this street going back into the 1920s or 40s or whatever? Um, and then one last thing I'll say is the reader also has an online searchable archive. And um, obviously they don't, you know, uh, write as many articles as the Tribune, but you can often find these wonderful long features about any number of things or places or people. Um, that just give a whole lot of color to, um, to these stories. So all of those. So after we do this research, what do you think it's important that people who live in these 
gentrified neighborhoods, what do we need to understand and recognize moving forward? Um, I guess I would say that, you know, neighborhoods don't just, um, there's nothing natural about the way neighborhoods are. It's, it's you know, human decisions all the way down. Um, and, you know, people worked very, very hard to make Lincoln Park the way that it is. Um, when, you know, these neighborhood associations were first founded in the 1940s and early 50s, um, the idea of a uh, middle class, upper middle class, wealthy neighborhood that close to the loop seemed completely fantastical and, you know, outdated. And they, you know, they worked very hard to um, create festivals that would get people to come to, um, you know, sue buildings, uh, building owners who they thought, you know, weren't taking care of their buildings well, which, you know, often was the case, although often did also result in the displacement of the people who were living there. They fought to, um, to bring an urban renewal program to Lincoln Park successfully and got, you know, thousands of buildings torn down um, uh, in order to change the neighborhood in a way that they thought would make it more attractive to people who at the time were, you know, fleeing to the suburbs. Um, and they succeeded beyond their wildest dreams um, and in ways that actually many of them found really troubling eventually um, and actually, you know, ended up um, opposing. Um, so, you know, I, I guess to take away, um, you know, if, if you look at a city like Chicago um, and you are disturbed or concerned um, by the level of segregation, not just of, you know, people by race and income, but of resources, private and public, um, of, you know, the stigma that go, that, that still attaches um, for a lot, you know, in particular white people um, for so much of the city. Um, Lincoln Park is part of that history. And um, and all of that was done, you know, happened as a result of um, people struggling on both sides to reshape the city as they thought was best. And so I guess the, you know, again, the what I come back to is if you can if you can understanding that that the way things are today is the result of people struggling over, you know, how they wanted the city to look. 20 or 50 or 100 years ago, um, then it's a pretty short step from the way the city looks in 10 years or 20 years or 50 years is also a result of what we do now. And so, um, you know, it matters, I guess, I guess the, the takeaway is it, it matters what we do and it matters, you know, the, the attention that we put and, and the care we put into shaping the way the city works and who it serves and who gets to take advantage of what the city has to offer. Um, and uh, obviously in this case, you know, making the case that Lincoln Park has a really central role in that. Absolutely. And you, you just started to mention that white flight out of the city. And I've also uh, started to hear about trends of people coming back into the city and moving into neighborhoods um, back in the city. So can you talk a little bit about the trends that are that we're seeing right now and, and what are their impacts? Yeah, so um, one of the things that I try to sort of um, complicate in the book is this, there's a sort of narrative sometimes that, you know, um, American cities were booming up until, um, you know, maybe the Great Depression or World War II, and then after World War II, everybody fled to the suburbs, or, but you know, by everybody, we mean, you know, white middle-class people and, and, and wealthier people flee to the suburbs. And then, you know, maybe at some point in like the 80s, 90s, into the 2000s, then there's this back to the city movement and these, you know, professional class white people start moving back. Um, there are some broad strokes, you know, that that's not like completely wrong. But one of the things I try to say in the book is that, you know, the process of people moving out further out and out and out from the city center and the process of 
higher income people and white people trying to reclaim parts of the inner city have been happening continuously since like the beginning of the 20th century. So already by the 19 teens and 20s, the sort of inner ring of the oldest neighborhoods in the city closest to the loop were losing losing population and in particular losing sort of native born middle class white people um, by like the hundreds of thousands. Um, so, you know, at that at that time, just because of the where the borders of the city were, where the sort of newly developable land was, many of them were moving just to further outlying city neighborhoods. But as the city stopped annexing new land and, you know, land just got eaten up by development, um, you know, the next generation then um, increasingly, uh, certainly after 1950, started moving to the suburbs and out of the city entirely. Um, and that was driven by, you know, some of the same things that had driven it back in the teens that, you know, um, the city was growing rapidly. There was a bunch of new housing being built. If you were middle class or above and you could afford newer housing rather than older housing, great, right? Uh, you know, that makes sense. Um, industry was booming. The inner neighborhoods were genuinely quite polluted um, or in many cases overcrowded. Um, and so people were, you know, pursuing generally, you know, I think genuinely higher quality of life um, further out. That was also, of course, pushed by a great amount of bigotry and racism against the kinds of people who were who were able to move into the older housing, immigrants, um, black people, um, increasingly uh, Mexican and Puerto Rican people as well, um, certainly around World War II. Um, so there was a, it was very it was very racialized the the move out, and then of course by the 30s and, and especially after World War II, it was heavily, heavily subsidized by the federal government. So the federal government creates all of these programs. Um, you know, it, it invents the 30 year mortgage and, and mortgage insurance. It builds highways to make it feasible for people to live in the suburbs because, I mean, you know, suburban land is basically worthless if you can't get two jobs in the city, right? And that's only possible via a, you know, truly like world historic investment in building highways. Um, so that's that's all happening and sort of ramping up through certainly the first half into the third quarter of the 20th century. And it's still happening to some extent. I mean, the, the outer bounds of the suburbs are still going out now and now. Um, but at the same time, starting in, you know, as early as the 19 teens, there are these sort of um, what are recognizably kind of gentrifying neighborhoods in the inner city. And one of the earliest ones is called Tower Town. It's named after the Michigan Avenue water tower uh, off of North Michigan Avenue on what's now the Magnificent Mile. At the time, in around World War I, it was um, old decaying mansions from the late 1800s um, that basically the rich people who had built them had fled. I mean, they, they were moving further out because the neighborhood was too, you know, had turned too grubby for them. Um, but, you know, in addition to lower income people, working class people, uh, immigrants and others who could take advantage of the fact that like, you know, the prices for these buildings were now so much lower, they were cut up into different, you know, apartments. Um, the other people who could take advantage of that were, you know, artists uh, and bohemians who had social connections to sort of the middle class world. They were generally from middle class families or, or wealthier families, um, but they themselves did not have a ton of money. And so they also took advantage of that and basically created, um, you know, one of the city's first sort of hip bohemian neighborhoods around the Michigan Avenue water tower when that was considered a, you know, working class neighborhood. Um, and, but they, you know, within a decade, uh, in a way that's very familiar to people today, right, they all, you know, first the artists come, and then a bunch of people who are interested in art, want to be around artists, want to be going to the cool cafes and concerts and things, um, but who themselves work in, you know, advertising or some other middle class profession uh, and therefore have money, they start to hang out there too. And then they start renting apartments there and then they start buying homes and then they start renovating the homes and pretty soon the artists have to move somewhere else. And that exact story basically played out in Tower Town in the teens and twenties. Um, so it was a very, it was a, you know, very small scale thing. And we're not talking about like, 
you know, a neighborhood of tens of thousands of people and, you know, area of just a few blocks really. But um, that process, uh, to go back to the original question, um, you know, that that process, so the, both both the sort of reclaiming by the middle class of these inner city neighborhoods that had been sort of abandoned by them, um, as well as the increasing flight out to the suburbs were sort of both happening at the same time, basically for the entire 20th century. Wow, Daniel, I'm like soaking this all in and, and learning so much. I really appreciate you sharing about those narratives. And I feel like we often, or at least I don't often hear about them in this local context. And so um, I really appreciate you expanding on that. Um, I know this isn't totally tied to the book specifically, but I'm curious in the work that you're doing now and the way that you're thinking about, um, you know, spaces and housing and transportation, if you can share with us the impact of COVID-19 um, on both like spaces and places and also people um, and what you're seeing from the work that you're currently doing. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, really, we don't know. Um, I think it, there's uh, enough data now that uh, has clearly shown that there's been some impact on urban housing markets, and in particular, urban rental housing markets, um, which, you know, had been, you know, the, the I think the context of, wh of when this is happening is important. So, you know, following the, uh, the housing market collapse of the previous decade of 2006 to 2008, um, there was, the, you know, when, which sort of took place at the end of a period of um, increasing homeownership, um, really sort of overheated uh, owner occupied housing markets, and especially single family. Um, there was this massive shift, particularly among higher income people um, into the rental market. So, you know, often, sometimes you hear when, you know, some new building gets proposed and it has, you know, $3,000 a month or $3,500 a month rents, like people will say, like, who on earth is paying, you know, so much money that, you know, in mo most of the city and certainly a decade plus ago, you know, those rents were not, you know, were very rare. And the answer is, it seems to be people who would have bought a house um, had they been 10 years older uh, are not we're not doing that, we're renting. And, you know, if you do the equivalent of like $3,000 a month in terms of a mortgage, you know, you're talking about a, I don't know, um, I'm gonna probably get this wrong, so don't, but you know, we're talking about maybe like a 500, 600, $650,000 building, um, which, you know, is a lot of money, but is doesn't sort of pop people's eyes in quite the same way. Um, what pops people's eyes is that this is happening in the rental market. Um, so anyway, so COVID hits that and what COVID seems to have done is at least a little bit pushed that back to a little bit the, the you know, what had happened previously where people are maybe now more looking at the owner occupied market, more looking at the suburban market at those, at those, higher, um, those higher price points. I think the question is, um, you know, what, is this just temporary um, or is there some sort of more permanent shift and I, I do not claim to have the answer to that at all. I my my sort of inclination is to say this is mostly temporary. Um, you know, one of the other lessons of the book, I think, like if there has been this ongoing process of middle class and professional class people, you know, sort of reclaiming parts of uh, the central city, and that's been going on for basically a hundred years. Um, that is not because of some sort of cultural fad. It's not because of some like generational trend. It, there is something structural there um, that is causing people to behave in this way. And my feeling is it is unlikely, that is unlikely to change meaningfully um, once uh, COVID is no longer a sort of acute threat to being around other people. Um, I think the pushback in the other direction would be, well, one of those huge structural forces is commutes, right? Is that people just want to live close to their jobs because it's, they'd rather spend less rather than more time commuting. Um, and that to the extent that COVID has sort of taught people and forced people to come up with this infrastructure to do remote work, well, then commutes are maybe less of a, less of a thing. Um, I tend to be, I mean, 
I guess we'll find out. I tend to be so skeptical that like everybody is going full remote and that, you know, even if you're only going into work three or four days a week, you're probably still going to prefer a shorter commute rather than longer. And at this point, there's so much else that's sort of been built into the um, sort of professional class inner city sphere in terms of cultural amenities, social networks, um, that, you know, there's lots of other reasons to want to be close to that if you're in that sort of social world. Um, so yeah, the, my, I guess the, the short, short, short answer is there has really been an effect um, in the short term. My, my bet would be that in the long term, we won't see like a major change in, in trajectory. Yeah, I appreciate you mentioning commutes because I think that's been on everybody's mind lately with this negative 20 degree weather. Oh, yeah. we don't have to make those commutes. Um, one of the biggest parts of your book that you talk about is the local group. So you have um, the Young Lords who are fighting against urban renewal. Then you have the LPCA and the LPCC, C, 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 right? Three Cs. Uh, <laughs> so what is the role of local groups in fighting against versus working for urban renewal? Yeah, um, yeah. Lincoln Park is a really interesting example of this because I feel like the the more common story of of neighborhood associations and urban renewal is them fighting to stop it. Um, the sort of you know famous highway revolts they're called, um, where people you know um, mobilized against having their homes torn down, um, either successfully or not successfully. I mean, you know, the Little Italy is a sort of prominent case study in that in Chicago uh, that was almost completely annihilated to build the UIC campus by Richard J. Daly in the 60s. Um, the northern part of Bronzeville where Lake Meadows and Prairie Shores is a similar story. Um, in Lincoln Park, these same kinds of neighborhood organizations uh, lobbied to bring urban renewal to Lincoln Park um, and they were successful and they, uh, it took about a decade uh, or more, but they were able to get the city to designate it as an urban renewal zone and um, again, you know, tear down um, an enormous amount of the neighborhood, you know, Larrabee Street, Oz Park, North Avenue. Um, at the same time, though, as you said, there were other groups that started to mobilize when urban renewal became a reality, other groups started to mobilize in the opposite direction. So there was a North Avenue business association that was um, you know, largely German immigrant, um, I think some Italian, a Syrian um, who mobilized against it. There was a neighborhood association that formed along Larrabee Street of people who lived there who, or who owned businesses on Larrabee who fought very hard and their letters are all in the DePaul archive and they're, I mean, they're heartbreaking. Um, especially because at that time there was so much urban renewal going on that, you know, many of the people who lived on Larrabee Street would write these letters, you know, asking for their homes to be spared and say, the, you know, we moved here from another place where we were displaced by urban renewal. Um, so, the, you know, this was happening to the same people two, three times, which was not a, not a mistake, right, because urban renewal almost always hit places that were, um, you know, working class, lower income, immigrant, black, you know, Latino, uh, areas. So, th so those people experience that over and over again. Um, and then, and then, so, you know, there were those groups who were really based in the particular areas that were being torn down. And then right later on in the, in the late sixties, there emerges the Young Lords, which um, starts out as a um, Puerto Rican street gang um, to, as basically a, you know, protection against the older sort of German and, and other sort of white immigrant street gangs that, that existed at the, at the time, um, but is sort of refounded in 1968 by its leader, Chacha Jimenez, who sees a Black Panther rally and is basically inspired to um, refound the Young Lords along the lines of the Black Panthers as the sort of radical revolutionary um, Puerto Rican nationalist organization. And one of their first big campaigns is against urban renewal. Um, and so they um, 
unlike the previous people who opponents who had sort of you know written petitions and and signed letters, um, they show up to urban to public meetings and like storm the stage and take over the meeting and basically refuse to let it go on, um, or they break the windows of the urban renewal office uh, on Halstead Street, um, and eventually they end up uh, actually trying to become developers. They actually hire a developer, hire an architect and try to and submit a bid to, um, to redevelop as affordable housing some of the land that had been cleared by urban renewal um, and are ultimately, they, they come very close, but are ultimately denied. The city council overturns a local board's decision um, and basically spells the end of their their period of resistance specifically against urban renewal in Lincoln Park. I feel like we could just go on and on with with all of our questions, but at this point, those are the questions that Melissa, Sam and I had made sure made sure we wanted to cover and we'll hop into covering some of the questions that our guests have. So um, I encourage you to write in the chat if you have a question. Um, you can either say, I have a question you wanna ask it aloud or you can just type the question and I'll read it on your behalf. So the first one, I, I really am glad this one was brought up is, do you have any recommendations if you live in an already gentrified neighborhood, what can help limit or possibly reverse some of the negative impacts? Yeah, um, I, you know, I think there's, I think there's two basic directions to go. One of them is just allow for more of the kinds of housing that people are likely to be able to afford. So, you know, um, rental housing, things like uh, the city just passed an ordinance uh, allowing uh, accessory dwelling units, ex additional dwelling units, sort of basement apartments, backyard homes, um, which we know, you know, tend to be more affordable than the other sort of market rate housing on the block. Um, but, you know, I think another one is just there, there is a desperate need for more subsidized housing all over the city. Um, there's, you know, the Institute for Housing Studies at DePaul estimates there's a 120,000 unit gap um, between the number of affordable homes needed in the city and the number that actually exist. And, um, you know, I mean, there's just, there's uh, given, uh, given the market dynamics in the city, there's just no way to close that without, um, you know, investment and, and, you know, the city, I think, can play an important role in that. But I think, you know, really, that is at a scale. And obviously, Chicago is not the only place that's dealing with this. It's at a scale that we need, you know, state and federal governments and federal government in particular to come in and really make investing in um, affordable housing a priority and something that, you know, people can can count on. So at the moment, they can. Thanks. Appreciate that. Does anyone else have questions they want to ask while we have Daniel and his time. Specific to um, affordable housing, are there any that you know of like bills, legislation as a citizen that we can um, be on the lookout for to be calling our legislators about for in support or um, not in support of, of maybe big developments that we maybe shouldn't be supporting anything legislatively that we should um, should know about. Sure, I'll just say one thing, which is um, part of the Biden administration housing plan. Um, and, you know, lots of things get written into plans and then not done, but um, I think there is some momentum behind this, is the idea that uh, housing vouchers ought to be an entitlement. So right now, if you, um, uh, if you qualify for SNAP benefits um, for food assistance, um, there's you know a bunch of bureaucratic hurdles to jump through. But if you qualify, you can get the assistance, right? Um, similarly, uh, if you um, qualify for the mortgage interest tax deduction, and that is mostly wealthier people who qualify for that, you just get it, right? There's no cap to the amount of money that the government will spend on that. Um, conversely, with uh, housing vouchers, housing support, rental housing support, uh, there's a cap of the amount of money. And so um, I think the number is about three quarters of the people who could qualify for housing assistance, um, who do qualify for housing assistance in the US don't get any housing assistance. 
Um, and those are basically exclusively lower income people who, for whom, you know, the, the programs that are designed to benefit them have a hard cap on how much money they can spend. Um, so I think, you know, the, uh, there are a bunch of like wonky reasons to get into about like why um, making housing vouchers universal would not on its own necessarily be the the, the last step you would want to take, but um, I think it would be a major it would be a major shift in the level of commitment to providing for people and making sure that people have the resources to actually get housing that they need. Thank you. I just had a, someone chat me a question. Um, is there a difference between what happened in Lincoln Park and what's happening today in neighborhoods like Pilsen? Yeah, I think the um, the underlying like social dynamics are pretty similar. And honestly, even the way that people talked about it at the time is I was constantly taken aback by how contemporary it seemed. I think the biggest difference, I think there's two big differences. One of them is that we don't really have urban renewal anymore. The federal government, the Nixon administration basically shut down that program. And so, you know, there is no chance that the city will seize all of the private property on 18th street, tear it all down and rebuild, you know, modern townhomes or mid rises or whatever. Um, that just doesn't, happen anymore with the notable exception of public housing, which, you know, is already publicly owned and sort of falls under, but, but private property does not get seized and torn down in the same way. Um, so that's one huge difference. The other huge difference is just, I think that people are conscious of gentrification as a powerful force now um, in, you know, even into the late sixties, into the, into the early seventies, and even beyond, there was um, just a ton of skepticism, even by people who were trying to make this happen and lived in Lincoln Park that you could really have a sort of stably middle class or professional class neighborhood in a old urban area. Um, like it just, people did not believe that it was possible or they thought it was very, very fragile. And now obviously people understand this has been going on at, at a large scale for so long that, you know, um, I, that skepticism isn't there. And it's more just sort of like a full on, you know, how do we make sure that um, the people who call that place home now or who would like to return there um, at whatever point or move there, that they're able to do that. Um, and there's less, I think, of a concern. Um, you don't hear as much, well, you know, we've got to drive as many middle-class people as we can there or else, you know, whatever. Absolutely. That was a great question um, and answer. Does We're just going to take one last question if anyone has one before we get into logistics of making sure the food gets to Lincoln Park Community Services on time. Does anyone want to snag the last question? I have a question if no one else has one. Um, hi, thanks for being here today and all of this. Um, would love to know more like with your research and obviously I try to do like I think we all try to do like what we can to ensure everyone has like equal housing and fair housing and equal opportunity. Um, but with the, with your research that you've done, what do you think is the best way to be an ally to people of color, folks that really their options are really only public housing? And obviously, um, while well, you mentioned what you just said in your answer, like it's not safe and secure. So what are the best steps? I mean, obviously like donating money and like giving to food banks, but what can we do in addition to be allies to folks in our community who um, may need additional services? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I guess I'll, I'll say two things. Um, one of them is, uh, you know, I think I think letting your elected representatives know that you know there are people in support of things like the Biden housing voucher plan is uh, is a big deal. Um, it matters that 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 is getting communicated to them. Um, I think the other thing I'll just say is there are a ton of um, as there were in the '60s. There are a ton of groups organizing all over the city um, for uh, on various housing issues and other issues that, you know, obviously are, are really important. And so I think what is wonderful about um, trying to, to help uh, with this sort of thing in, in a place like Chicago is that you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, there are so many 
groups that are working on so many different issues and um you know many of them led by and 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 um you know constituted by the people who are most affected by the problems um and so i think plugging into those groups finding the one that is working on something that you feel particularly called to to throw your time and labor into um is yeah i think another another great way of of helping to make some change awesome thank you so much daniel um you all were sent a copy of of his book if you didn't receive it for some reason definitely don't hesitate to private chat me and we can make sure that you receive your copy um and if there's lots of just great information in there. So Daniel, thank you so much for bringing that book to life for us today and for really helping us understand um, the relationship between urban renewal and gentrification and its um, its relationship to racial justice and, and race. I know I learned a lot. I'm sure other folks here did too. Um, thank, thank you so much for having me. This was a lot of fun. Yes, of course. Um, I want to give a couple of words of logistics around food drop off and pick up. Um, so the food has to be, we got a little extension on time, delivered by 6 p.m., not 5.30. Um, there is a phone number you can call when you arrive. There's parking spots out in front. This is the phone number, I'm putting it in the chat, so make sure you write it down. Um, you can call that number and let them know that you're outside. There are parking spots in front of the shelter. Um, and then you can leave the food outside the door if you want to make sure that it's 100% contact plus and you don't need to go inside anywhere. And then someone will come out and the person working the front desk will come out and get the food from you. Um, so it should hopefully be as little bit of time out of your car as possible given the weather and also um, COVID safe and contactless. Um, Molly, Hannah, and my husband are doing food pickups. Um, so if you haven't been notified of who was picking up your food and you have questions, reach out to Molly, Hannah, or myself, I suppose, um, and I'll communicate that to Jason. Um, and um, if you're dropping off these, um, those are the directions for drop off. I'm going to put the address in the chat as well in case it's escaped you. And if you have any issues, I'm also going to put my phone number um, in the chat if for some reason you can't reach someone or you have any questions. Those are the drop off and pick up instructions. And thank you all so much for giving um, your time and your, your resources to, to be cooking and, and delivering food. I know it's really deeply appreciated. And thank you, Daniel, for helping us um, contextualize our acts of service and generosity with your um, knowledge about Lincoln Park. Thank you. Have an amazing rest of your day. If you're planning to come to the closing at 4 p.m., Rabbi Megan and I will see you there. And otherwise, thank you so much and have a great rest of your Sunday. Thanks everyone. Thank you, it was wonderful. Jordan, you wrote me that you didn't get the book. I'll send one to Moisha House. Okay, do you have our address? No, could you share it with me? Yeah, of course I have your address. <laughs> <laughs> like we open <it> online. <laughs> <laughs> Moisha House.